Okay, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting of uh, for the medical advisory subcommittee meeting to order. Um, I'll take roll. Meg Delian is present. So is Jim Romanoff. Uh, James Pepper is also present. Uh, Jim, do we have anyone else in the room with you? Um, just uh, Orca Media is recording this for the public. Okay. Uh, and then we also have uh, some guests, Matt Myers and Shane Lynn, today as well. Um, did everyone, Jim and Meg, did you have a chance to review the minutes yet? I, I thought you had those earlier. Um, if not, we can we can move to approve next meeting. I <laughs> I'm sorry. I did have a chance to review those. You, you did or did not? I did. Okay, Jim. Did you have a chance for review? Yeah. And, and any questions or discussion? Okay. Can I just get a motion to approve those, and then we'll move on to our presenters? Motion to approve uh, minutes from the last meeting. Second. Okay. So moved. And Meg, did you want to uh, to provide an, an introduction for us? Tommy, and, can I pause for just one second? Sorry. Matt, are you Dr. Levine's designee? That's yes. correct. That's right. Okay, I just want to clarify that. I'm sorry. Yeah. And so we met Myers as, as a designee for, for Dr. Levine. Um, and then Meg, I'll let you move on to our presentation. And Shane, one of the things we were, well, um, I mean, there's a number of issues we're discussing in the subcommittee meeting, but, but one of them was in the context of protecting the medical patients as the transition moves uh, to, to adult use legalization. Uh, and what Jim and Meg had discussed uh, was creating, helping create or develop a, a baseline of, of products that would be available for, for medical patients. Um, and I'm sure a, a number of other questions that, that uh, we've discussed and the issues might come up as well. Um, but w with that, Meg, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you introduce uh, our, our guest. Sure. Uh, so this is Shane Lynn. He is the president of Series Med. Um, Shane, go right ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Appreciate it. Um, I got into uh, cannabis here in Vermont probably about a dozen years ago. Uh, started going to the state house and sitting in committee meetings, and uh, that all came about because I had family and friends that were using cannabis. Uh, you know, mainly uh, it was cancer, and the other was Parkinson. And so for me, it was uh, very personal. Uh, I then started talking to community leaders and trying to understand, hey, what is the status of cannabis? I learned that people could be growing at home. Um, and I also then heard some stories of, you know, doctors would tell people to uh, go to Church Street and ask people on Church Street if they could buy cannabis, uh, basically on the street. And that seemed really, uh, that seemed, that seemed really bad. Uh, and just around that time, Colorado was going through uh, their medical uh, uh, opening, and that really gave me the impetus to to really get involved in medical cannabis. And back to, uh, you know, wanting to understand the process and, and so going to the state house to really uh, understand uh, what a, a program would look like. And while you know attending these committee meetings, I got to hear a lot of other Vermonters that were utilizing cannabis uh, for their symptom relief uh, and really uh, started to gain appreciation how for how uh, dramatic the changes were for people uh, uh, in utilizing cannabis for their symptom relief. Um, with that, I, you know, started talking to um, you know, the community people, how, how I go about creating a business and start really getting involved uh, in, in, in building a business to, to dispense cannabis. Um, and we literally started off with one other employee, myself and one other person. And we've continued to, to grow uh, over the years. Uh, over the past eight years, we're up to 60 employees at this point. Um, and we're really, you know, really dedicated to uh, making sure that our products uh, are the highest quality to our patients and that we have a diversity of products as well. Um, this was an industry when we first started, uh, we had a phone tree where we would call in case, uh, you know, the phone tree of lawyers to call in case we got raided by the DEA. There was real uh, potential threat that we would uh, potentially be raided. 
those were headline stories uh, happening in California when we opened our doors, and so there was that uh, that concern, and uh, you know, and yet uh, I had staff and myself included willing to take that risk because uh, it was something that we believed in. Uh, and part of this bigger picture of yes, the campus plant and its ability to you know provide symptom relief was the social change uh, around that as well. Uh, and so we've all been very active uh, in that conversation over all these years at this point. Um, it's been a huge investment of money, uh, you know, over time. Like I said, we started with one employee. Uh, we started with, uh, you know, basically a 400 uh, square foot dispensary. Uh, I was there myself uh, in the, the first years dispensing cannabis. Uh, so, uh, you know, we had one office and we would see one person at a time and really got to know the stories of Vermonters coming in and how they were utilizing cannabis and some of the struggles they were having as well, which were always financial. Uh, the cannabis uh, is you know, out of pocket. There's no insurance involved. Um, in the original bill that we operated under, there was a, a mandatory sliding scale. Uh, that was something that we took very serious and, and went through a lot of different iterations of how to manage a sliding scale. Uh, and to make sure that it was fair across the board. Uh, where we've ended at at this point is to utilize the three square program in Vermont. If you have a three square card, uh, that will get you onto our discount program uh, so that there's a sliding scale. Um, and um, we allow people to, to stack their discounts as well. You know, if you're a veteran uh, on the sliding scale, uh, we also have sales throughout the week that we. Uh, we, we highlight to our patients to make sure that it's affordable because everything is out of pocket and uh, we understand the, the expense of that for, for people. Um, and so we've made all the efforts we can uh, in the size of the program that we're operating under. It's a small program and it has uh, you know stalled over the, uh, over the past few years, I would say. Uh, and those are difficulties uh, for a business in, in trying to maintain um, our service, our level of service, because uh, we understand um, when people, a lot of, you know, our average age is, is probably about 52 to, you know, 53 uh, on the dispensary, the, the folks that we serve, the split's about 50% women, 50% men. It's trending women right now. Uh, a lot of these people are novice cannabis uh, folks uh, when they come in the door. So we spend a lot of time teaching people about cannabis as well. Uh, we don't just think it's the product that we're offering, but it's also the service that we're offering. Uh, we really try to inform people. Uh, we have a, uh, a permanent position of an outreach director that reaches out to the hospitals uh, in town, out to doctors as well. There's a lot of the conversations. I used to go on those tours as well uh, around the state, drive to a hospital, drive to a doctor's office. We do a presentation, you know, uh, for about an hour, uh, inform people about the program, how it worked, what it didn't do, what it could do, um, and try to really teach people uh, about the Vermont law and then about cannabis at the same time. And uh, we continue to, uh, you know, utilize aid as services and, and outreach. A lot of people we talk to just don't even understand that we have a program. Uh, and some of that's because we're not allowed to advertise. And, you know, we took that very uh, serious. We still take it seriously, but in the beginning, we also got, kept our visibility down because we were afraid of being arrested. Uh, and now that the world's kind of changed at this point, um, we're still not able to kind of broadcast what we do out to uh, the larger um, demographics of, of the Vermont communities. And so a lot of people still don't know that there's a medical program here in Vermont. Uh, and so some of our mission has been back to that social change and, and updating people um, about this alternative um, uh, uh, treatment or, you know, for, for symptom relief. And so uh, we take it really serious. Uh, you know, the pandemic was um, uh, obviously been a struggle for, for everybody. Um, we kept our doors open the entire time. Uh, we didn't close our doors. Uh, we were able to serve our patients day in and day out. We had to make adjustments. Uh, we had to work with the Department of Public Safety to come up with a curbside program that was safe, not only for our staff, but for, uh, for the patients as well. Uh, and we have, uh, we've been very proud of, of doing that over the past year and a half. Um, I'm proud to say that my staff uh, has remained COVID free as well. And so back to not only, uh, you know, that, that balance over the years has been one of the, the harder challenges for us, 
is how do we balance the patient care and understanding of the economic demands, uh, you know, for being in the program that's put on the patient, and then how do how do we also face the challenges with our staff and understanding that they want benefits, they want a livable wage, they want to have a career path, and so those two things uh, are, are tough to struggle in a small market, uh, and um, and so we've really try to focus on both of those things over time uh, because they both contribute uh, to the success of the program in treating uh, Vermonters. Um, and you know, back to being proud that we've done this over time. Um, and you know, back to, I think if you, you know, I, I know my staff takes pride uh, in what they do and the conversations that they have with the Vermonters uh, every day. We. Also, do a thing called uh, Meet Your Medicine Maker. Um, that's where we, uh, went for pre-COVID, we'd invite them into our facility, and you know we roughly have anywhere from 50 to 60 patients come in. We teach them how to grow cannabis, how to dry it, how to cure it. Uh, we'd also teach them how to um, uh, infuse edibles. You know, so back to people's budgets and understanding the constraints. Uh, we've always supported home grow. Uh, we understand uh, sometimes that uh, the medicine is, yes, the cannabis, uh, the cannabis plant, but also growing the plant itself can be very, very therapeutic for some people. Uh, so we've tried to educate them about that. And then for their budgets, like, hey, this is how you can make edibles at home. If this is your budget, here's a product you can buy. We offer a shake at a very reasonable price. It's lab tested. And then, hey, this is how you'd go home, make butter. Uh, and then make some edibles for yourself, and that will make your, your your dollar go the longest. And so we really try to come at this from many different angles in serving the population here in Vermont. Um, we also do guest lecture series. You know, we invite people to talk uh, to to patients and our staff, trying to constantly uh, educate people. Obviously, the cannabis industry is fast changing. You know, we like to kind of joke that it's like a it's like a dog year, seven years, you know, one year is equal to seven years. Uh, it's a lot of information everybody's trying to stay up with, uh, you know, and that's where uh, the program um, hasn't necessarily evolved as fast as, as the cannabis uh, world is. And, and we're looking forward to, to that occurring uh, in the coming years. I think that will be um, uh, really influential in, in staying committed to the patients uh, and that is our goal in the future market is that commitment you know we're willing to uh, prioritize them when they come to the store uh, we're willing to uh, have separate entrances for them as well uh, to, to remain you know uh, to, to give them privacy if they want that privacy when they're coming to the dispensary um, certain products for sure uh, that we uh, want to offer them. Uh, I know there's THC limits in the future market. Uh, we, you know, we do custom formulations for some people. I know there are a few, uh, you know, children that uh, are on our patient list that we make products specifically for. Uh, we're, we will continue to do that as well. Um, you know, the overall part of this is that we're, we are committed to, to serving Vermonters. I was born and raised here. I went to school here, elementary school, high school, college. Uh, this is my town. This is this is my state, uh, and I understand the demands that are put on people. And to go full circle with that, you know, my original board, uh, you know, there were patients on my original board, uh, and they were uh, driving our mission uh, in the very beginning. Uh, they unfortunately passed away from their conditions, uh, but they are still with us in, in spirit, uh, and it's important uh, that we are committed to that uh, over the long haul here. So. Um, Back to maybe taking a break. I don't know if there's questions for me here. I feel like you know I could probably talk for an hour about the program. I've you know been doing this for for eight years. Uh, I'm passionate about it. Uh, I want to see it succeed. Uh, I want to make sure that we're investing money in it in the right places. Uh, I, I'm happy to um, designate a certain amount of inventory uh, to the medical patients. I, I would suggest though, if, if we do inventory, that we uh, go towards dried flour and biomass, and those are kind of the raw materials to say, all right, we'll set aside these raw materials, and from that we can make the products that are in high demand. I'd be reluctant to potentially say, oh, here are these products, make sure you have 10 of these and 20 of those. Well, you know, one thing we have learned in the cannabis market is uh, there can be um, moments where there's high demand on certain products. And so 
uh, just having some flexibility if we make those commitments would be imper important as a business operator. And I, and I think that comes from, hey, make those commitments in the raw inventory and then we can allocate that to our patients, uh, you know, being able to judge the market and what's, um, what's being demanded, so. Um, I, 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 John, if, I don't know if there's some questions, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 have, I have some questions. Go ahead, I certainly have a few too. Go, go ahead, Jim. Okay, um, you were mentioning uh, concentrates earlier. This will just help me to understand, you know, uh, people's expectations in terms of products that they might use now for treatment and what their availability might be in the future. So we know we have some uh, uh, THC limits. Hopefully we'll be able to address that for the medical community and that won't be uh, an issue. But if, uh, what, is, what is the roughly the, the breakdown between people using flour and A little pretty consistent at about 50%, 50-50. I'd say we're probably maybe into 55% flour right now. During COVID, flour demand went up, um, you know, and maybe crept into 58%, you know, like almost a 60-40, but we're starting to see that shift a little the other way right now. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we monitor, you know, uh, tried flour is uh, tried and true. It is, uh, you know, it, it, patients want their dried flour. We understand uh, diversity is really important for the patient on that level as well. And the continued access of that, that has been something that we have struggled with. Uh, you know, we have a favorite strain right now. It's sour kush and, you know, and it's whatever percentage of our sales. And, you know, uh, so we try to grow more of it and then we take one strain away and then someone's like, well, where'd that strain go? You know, we're like, well, we're trying to grow more sour kush. And so to find that balance, it's it, that's been tricky. And, you know, uh, I went to the state house three or four years ago and, and suggested that we start working with craft growers. We would we would uh, be very open to uh, making purchases from craft growers. I think that's where the future rec market is a is a boom for hopefully for uh, the medical market. We could buy from craft growers, bring that diversity of flour into the medical market, and you know give patients a, a wider selection of drug flour. Um, thank you. Um, I want to follow up on my concentrate question, and I want to say thank you. I, I read the letter today. Uh, passed on today and, and really appreciate uh, the thoughts in there and appreciate you being here today and uh, and giving us all this background. So my question about concentrates is if there are THC limits and let's say uh, a, a vape cartridge is a popular, uh, you know, uh, for use with medical patients and uh, those are at a higher percentage THC percentage is it realistic production wise to think that if you don't have that kind of inventory available you know a certain amount of, of cartridges that that's the kind of thing that the the capacity is there to turn around and say oh yeah we could just we can bang out a bunch of uh, you know uh, this or that uh, kind of cartridge at, at the size that's the most effective cost for the you know patient yeah, I, yeah, and so and so my interpretation of the of the, of the bill right now, X one sixty four, is that yes, there's a, there is a limit on THC concentrates, uh, you know, that, at sixty percent, but it's for solid concentrates. So I don't think that applies to vape pens, uh, you know, and so I, I don't think there's going to be an issue there uh, in manufacturing of vape pens. Um, you know, vape pens are one of our most popular items at the dispensary. Uh, again, that diversity of product with the vape pen, hey, what dried flour are we extracting and putting in there is really important. Um, and so I, I don't think we're going to have any issues with meeting that demand. We've been doing vape pens now for over six years. Uh, we've licensed that technology from OPEN, you know, and, and it's been really working well, and we understand the kind of the efficiencies. There are certain strains, though, FYI, kind of, that actually extract better than other strains. Like, you can get a higher yield with plant A versus 
fee potentially. Right. Uh, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, we, we, and as we can hopefully scale a little bit here, some of our priority will grow plant A because it gives a higher yield when we extract it. Uh, and, and making sure that that fits with, uh, you know, the patient's um, uh, taste and, 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 and effect for symptom relief. So, one, one last question. So, that being said, and I appreciate the clarification, the answer to that, I understand that. Uh, and uh, understand your answer. So if on the list of, of products that patients are using now, if you were to identify and say, boy, this is the one area where this could be, this, is, this could be tight. You know, uh, we've got to wait and see how much demand there is, but it, it definitely is something we wouldn't make for the, the adult use market. Uh, I'm curious. I mean, is there any area that worries you? Uh, that's a good question, and I haven't necessarily thought about it in that way. You know, in the sense, oh, we won't make that on that side. I think the bigger question that we've been looking at are the THC limits and recognizing. You know, we have some products that have 80 milligrams of THC in them. Uh, you know, we recognize that patients uh, want that. And for us, that'll potentially turn into well, we're going to be making other edibles over here that. Uh, are under a certain amount of THC, and they were going to be at scale. You know, we're going to be able to, to make hundreds of those in a day. Whereas over here, we're going to make an 80 milligram cookie, but we're only going to make 50 of those. And that's, that's a different kind of scale. And that's the commitment, though, that we want to make to the program to say that we will continue to make that cookie or, or that uh, caramel or whatever it might be because uh, we know that the medical patient wants that high dosage, especially people that are, you know, in uh, chronic pain, uh, going through chemotherapy. These high dosages are what they're they're asking for. And so we've, you know, we have over 150 SKUs at this point. Um, we get, you know, I have a production team. They look for efficiencies. There are products that we make uh, in a week that maybe are only 20 or 30 of them. It's not very efficient to make those products at all, but we make them, we've been making them all these years because we know there's certain people out there on the registry that want those products. And we want to we want to provide that service. We see that as the service that we're providing. This isn't uh, all the time about the bottom line. This is about serving Vermonters. And if we can make that effort, uh, as the program grows, you know, uh, we will, uh, we, we will, and we'll commit to, um, you know, serving patients, and that's back to custom formulations. Um, there's still a lot of science to be determined here with uh, uh, cannabinoids, you know, and and how they work uh, best, and what kind of um, uh, formulas, you know, ratios are best, and I think they're probably are going to end up being certain ratios um, that. You know, great that fits 80% of the medical population, and then this ratio potentially works for 20% of the population. We're still going to make those ratios, though, that work for 20% of the population. So, okay. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for the answers. Thanks, Jim. Nick, you mind if I? No. I probably have more than a few. Shane, thanks again. Um, I've got I've got a number of questions, but I just wanted to get a little bit more background if I could. Um, so you are one of, I guess there's five, but there, there are really four license holders in, in medical. Uh, uh, there are five total licenses in the state, uh, and we hold two of those licenses. Okay, so so, you, so you've got two of them. I mean, can you tell me? And you don't have to get too too specific, um, but. Is, is there a level of, and I'm in, I'm in Arizona, and, and I've, um, I advise certain clients here as well. Is there a level of collaboration um, between and amongst you, or is, is it fairly competitive? Because I know what how it is here in Arizona, but I've advised clients, I said, listen, if you guys could just get along on some level, you could really accomplish a lot, and, but it, it never really happened. So I just don't know what the environment is, is like in Vermont. No, uh, you know, um, 
Yes, we're competitors. I would say that, but you know, the law basically, uh, first when it originated, uh, said that we could barter with one another. We couldn't actually have a cash transfer. So if you had, if I had, uh, you know, 50 pre rolls and you had uh, whatever gummies, we could barter that. We lobbied to change that so we could just have transact straight old transactions between the dispensaries. I think that probably happened three or four years ago. And so right now we have a great we have a uh, you know a great working relationship as businesses with one another. Um, you know we work with uh, the group and and Brandon at uh, Grassroots. Uh, we actually purchase flour from them right now, and we purchase that flour because we want to diversify our uh, strain selection. And so we right. work with them on that. The group in Montpelier for my Patients Alliance uh, they purchase uh, edibles from us right now. So we're selling them edibles. Uh, which is great. And then on the political front, uh, yeah, we, we work together and we work through, you know, sure. trades association. Sure. And I expect that part of it. But I guess where I was getting, what, what I was trying to get at, did you, so you have a, a pretty good idea of each other's inventory. Uh, when we call to ask, hey, what flour do you have? Like when I call uh, grassroots, hey, what, what, what inventory do you have for flour? They, they say, well, we, we have these strains, we have this much. That, that's as much as I know, you know, okay. the flour. So. Yeah. Fair enough. And um, I, I mean, with Jim's questions, I, I think what would be most helpful to know, um, and again, if, if this is proprietary, you know, you, I understand if, if you want to disclose it, but. Um, you, you started mentioning your production team. Um, yeah. so I, I imagine you've got um, analytics <laughs> or records on which products, uh, you know, are, are the most popular. Like you were saying, you, you know, which are the least. Yeah. That, that that's what would probably be most helpful to the committee to determine. Um, you know, one, we're trying to define that baseline of products to protect uh, the medical patients during the transition. Um, whatever analytics you have on that, um, or, or would be willing to share, then we, that that would probably help us the most to determine that list that we're trying to create. Um, well, yeah, yeah, uh, no, I appreciate that. And you know, like I said, hey, flour is roughly fifty-five percent right now, maybe fifty, you know, depending where we are in the trend. Uh, vape pens are very popular, uh, and then we have gummies. You know, we call them PDFs. Uh, they're they're more of a, um, a fruit base, so they're all natural. They're petafui is the French name for them. Um, and then we have micro mints. So we do a lot of actually micro dosing as well. I mean, that's another product potentially. You know, for the patient base that that's not a rec uh, focus, but we have uh, uh, you know we have customers that want micro dosing, and so we have. Uh, mints that are two and a half milligrams of THC. Uh, the PDFs are five milligrams. So back to um, giving the patient the ability to manage their dosages throughout the day, and I, you know, and the overall big picture for cannabis for me, and one of the things that uh, you talked to the state house about over the years is the different methods of consumption for cannabis are one of the greatest benefits of cannabis that you can smoke it, you can eat it, you can drink it. Those different methods are important. And transdermal patches, we do a transdermal patch. So I can get you some numbers. I'm not sure if we'll you know put the percentages of what sales they are, but I can definitely give you our top 10 you know products and you know, uh, but back to um, that raw inventory and, and, and securing that and saying, hey, we will dedicate this much of the raw inventory to products is I think the probably the best way to go. Uh, but open to that discussion to, to understand uh, wh where everybody here is coming from. Right, and, and, and that was my follow-up because I, I did note that, that you mentioned um, maybe it's more efficient if if we base this around the raw inventory. You you would be able to extrapolate that from, from your top 10? I, I think we could get within a range. I don't think it'll, you know, be exact, but to, you know, to start to talk about percentages, I think there's probably a, a, a uh, you know, safer model for us. So we, we're, we're not, uh, hey, we, my concern is, hey, we made all these products and we've kept them and then they have a shelf life and then they expired and we didn't sell them in time versus saying, hey, we've got biomass, 
uh, and dried flour and potentially oil would be the other part. Like, hey, we'll have this much oil on hand. And that way we then can make whichever edibles we know are being bought and then what kind of dosage is being bought too. I'm wondering just back to, you know, we've made suggestions for changes to the program. Uh, and, you know, my fingers are crossed that the state house uh, acknowledges that the, the program needs an update. And with those changes, what kind of demand will come from those? We don't know that. That's the hard part to, to forecast down the road. So how do we create some flexibility in recognizing we're going to change the program and we need the flexibility to, to see what's going to come from that? Um, but um, so happy to continue, you know, trying to understand um, what those products would be or back to the inventory. Uh, I think that's the safest route for as a business uh, to go. Good. Matt, I see you've got your hand up. Thanks for all that information. It's interesting. Um, I didn't know part of it. Um, I guess I come from the more of the prevention side of things. And so, um, just hearing you say that you make products for children, I, could you say more about that and if you have concerns about that at all? Oh, for sure. Uh, that's where we work with the parents. We work with uh, the pediatrician or whoever the doctor might be uh, in doing this. And this isn't, um, you know, something we do on our own. It's in consultation. You know, the parents, that's just where a caregiver comes into the picture. Caregiver is the person that comes into the dispensary. We don't allow anybody under 18 into the dispensary. Uh, so, hey, a parent signs up, the child signs up, you know, the parent signs the child up on the program, uh, the parent signs up as a caregiver, we interact with the parent. That, that's our role. And then back to the custom formulations, that's usually occurring because they're working with their doctors. Their doctor is usually uh, a can, can, uh, cannabinoid uh, specialist or understands it. We say, hey, this is what we can do, or we've done this before, you know, and a lot of it is back to those ratios, the CBD to THC, uh, and, and understanding, you know, how much they want of that ratio, and how many times a day will they be dosing, you know, and a lot of times it ends up either in a transdermal patch uh, or in a tincture. Uh, and, you know, it's this isn't smokable product, um, and, and so we're very mindful of, of working with people under 18. Do you, just one follow up. Um, are you aware of any research that that um, would guide uh, the dosage and would indicate outcomes, et cetera, um, for children? I, I would uh, have to reach out to Ada, or uh, you know, our outreach director, uh, and see if we can get some of that for you. You know, Ada's usually involved in these conversations. That uh, she's the bridge to the to the hospitals. So I'm I'm happy to look for that and, and pass that along um, to you. That'd be great. Thank you. If, if I could just add in for a second there, Shane. I think some of besides some of the HIV patients early on in Vermont's medical program. In uh, Vermont and many of the uh, medical programs in different states, uh, childhood seizures, uh, yes. I'm not sure whether it's specifically epilepsy, but it's been, uh, it's got the most human studies done on it. The efficacy is uh, really uh, spectacular to the degree that uh, countries like the UK that really have very limited, limited, limited medical uh, cannabis will uh, allow treatment of uh, childhood seizure. So that's, I think that was, I think it was Charlotte's, uh, what was the name of the organization that was initially working to make sure the parents could treat their kids. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that in. That's the. Uh, and that's a great uh, point, Jim, because in our first years, uh, we would go to meetings with probably about five parents uh, a couple doctors in the room and everybody was trying to understand uh, how this was working and that was the Charlotte's Web and uh, back to uh, you know they're a Colorado based Colorado based uh, company uh, they're still out there um, and you know back to CBD to THC uh, a lot of that is that ratio so um, and that UK company is the GW pharmaceutical uh, is it Sativex? And then uh, I can't remember the other product that they put out, but those are um, based on cannabis uh, therapies. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Shane. If I could just 
you could continue to indulge me while, while oh, I go through. Oh, please, no, I'm here. I'm, I'm you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Great. So, appreciate uh, the time. so, and again, and just from what I know here in Arizona, so we, we were medical for a while, uh, just this past year, then we transitioned um, uh, with our ballot initiative, went rec. Uh, the the existing medical license holders had a pretty powerful lobby, so not surprisingly, all the rec is through uh, the medical dispensaries. And then we've been consistent with with the rest of the nation in that you know then the rec sales kind of dominate um, and, and and continue to grow. But it sounds like you're you're willing um, to help us uh, develop this this list. Um, to continue to protect uh, protect the medical, medical patients and make sure they, they continue to have access. Uh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, that's always been, you know, part of our concern is, you know, right. the rec market will be uh, whatever amount, 10 times larger, you know, right. and it, it will be easy, it would be, um, you know, e easy for uh, the medical program to be surpassed, uh, you know. Uh, and so how do we create a program that's sustainable, though? And that, that's the big picture here. How do we continue to provide services and products uh, to Vermonters that want to utilize it uh, uh, as an alter alternative, you know? And my concern is, uh, and it's a genuine, is I, I, a person that is sick, um, they've already got a lot of stress, anxiety. They've gotten potentially bad news from the hospital. They're navigating the hospital system. They're navigating the insurance system. Um, and then potentially they have to go to a, a recreational store where, you know, not to, you know, it may, you know, compare it to a liquor store, you know, and, and, and we don't, I don't want that. That's not why I got into this industry. Um, you know, we believe in the power power of the plant, and, and we want to make sure, though, behind that are people that have knowledge and, um, you know, respect for the customer that's coming in and, and their position that they may be in with their health care um, and the stresses of that. And so how do we, you know, basically hold their hand so they can go through this process uh, and understand how to utilize cannabis without being overwhelmed with all the knowledge that uh, it takes to actually utilize cannabis the right way. Um, because it does take knowledge to do that uh, efficiently. And, you know, that. So, so one, one of my questions for you, and, and one of the initiatives I think we, yeah, we, we voted on, and this was Meg's suggestion, was just more data collection for, for VMR access. Um, are there things that you've asked the, the state or, or do you have any ideas, anything that would assist you as far as more data collection um, to help the, the medical program? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, you know, back to, hey, publishing certain data, you know, throughout the year, understanding the ups and downs of the program. You know, I looked at the the V, uh, the Vicente Cedarburg model that was uh, given to the control board. You know, and you can really see uh, the the downturn in, in patients coming onto the program in 2018. Uh, that's a reflection of home grow. Uh, that's something we, we supported actually, you know, back to people being to grow at home. Uh, but it was really detrimental to the program because the program didn't change at that time. I, I, that would, For us, that would have been an opportune time to, to allow the program uh, to remove some hurdles from signing up, you know. And there is, you know, an economy of scales here to, to running businesses and, and providing, you know, jobs. Like I said, that challenge of providing jobs uh, and a future a career path for people that want to come into the cannabis industry and then providing um, cannabis uh, at a price that is affordable to everybody here in Vermont. And so those two things compete uh, with each other. And it is a reflection of the size of the program and the hurdles to get into it. And so how do we remove some of those hurdles and, and allow the program to grow? Uh, considering, you know, everybody that uh, wants to grow cannabis in Vermont right now can grow cannabis. Uh, they're, 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 you know, they're allowed to do that. Yeah, I, I was curious when you were saying you were giving uh, training sessions or seminars uh, about home grows. Uh, what are you, what are you telling them about um, just pesticides or the you know the fact that they're they're not going through through testing and, and you are uh, what are the types of things that, that you're highlighting to them for for the home growers 
Oh, well, you know, that comes to pruning the plant, you know, making sure the plant doesn't get to, you know, especially if it's been a wet year, this has been a wet year in Vermont. Uh, and so back to making sure, first to start with making sure that you're pruning the plant so that it's uh, got some air moving through it to avoid having to potentially apply anything to the plant. And then at that point, uh, you know, there's nothing that's um, specific to cannabis at this point because it's still federally illegal. And so we work with the Ag Department. Uh, and so we have a director of cultivation that works directly with uh, Kerry Jaguar. Uh, and Kerry provides the information and, and that information basically centers around, hey, what's allowed to be on the hemp plant? Uh, and so Seth works directly with the Ag Department. Uh, for us personally, all of our staff that are on the cultivation team have licenses to apply pesticides. Uh, and so we try to provide the, the information that we've learned, uh, you know, in, uh, from the Ag Department, we try to pass that on to the, uh, the patient that's growing at home. Um, and, you know, but, it, but growing at home is a challenge for some, you know, some people don't have a green thumb. And, and so, you know, it, it's a difficult thing for some people. Uh, and I'm, you know, back to, I think it's being talked about that a patient can grow at home and potentially go to the dispensary as well. You know, that way uh, they don't have the stresses of potentially their crop, their crop failing, um, you know, and, and, and that's, um, you know, that's a real concern if you're growing outdoors versus indoors. And that would go back to pesticides. It's a whole different matter if you're growing indoors versus outdoors where you're going to be applying on the plant. Um, and that's, again, looking to the Ag Department and passing that information on to uh, the patients. And, and are you, are your facilities indoor or outdoor or both? We do both actually. So we got indoor cultivation uh, and we do uh, an outdoor cultivation as well. You know, it's harvest uh, season here. So uh, we're busy uh, doing that as well. And just sorry, out of curiosity, what, what, what percentage is indoor? Uh, 90 probably percent, you know, a lot of our outdoor crop is really used for biomass. Uh, you know, um, the top colas, you know, select cuts uh, from the plant uh, would potentially go to dried flower. Uh, but back to cost savings, growing outdoors, using that biomass to produce uh, a less expensive oil to go into the product. Those are the innovations that we've been trying to do over the years to lower the cost for the patient. And so for us, recognizing we, you know, using indoor uh, flour to make a product uh, that you're extracting into oil doesn't make sense. So use your outdoor, it, it's a cheap production. You, you've worked, um, you've worked with, with doctors um, and, and healthcare providers. I mean, what we've recommended is allowing the healthcare providers to determine um, the diseases and conditions that, that will help qualify the patient. What are your thoughts on that? I'm really supportive of that. You know, I think, you know, back to we allow healthcare providers to make all the other decisions out there uh, and, you know, on, on a person's personal care, uh, I think that should be a conversation between the doctor and the patient. Um, and having the state potentially make a list, uh, I, you know, it, it, it served a purpose in the beginning. I, I think that purpose has been served. And, and now, you know, we're in a different age of, of cannabis uh, consumption uh, and, and usages and let the healthcare provider determine that. Um. Increasing the possession limit to three three plants and three ounces or whatever the adult use. No, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So like, how do we remove any all oh, this and that? It's like no, it's clear. It's it's both. It's similar. There's no confusion. Everybody's okay. abiding by the law and, and not confused by the law. Reciprocity with medical cards. You're in favor. Uh, very much so. I, we think that will, uh, you know, I, that's about the sustainability of the program. Uh, we are, you know, in Brattleboro, um, and we get people stopping all the time and saying, hey, you know, they're at the door, they'll show their, you know, I'm a medical patient, can I come in? And you're like, no, you can't, uh, you know, and so we're turning people away. It also happens with our Middlebury location, we get people driving over from New York. Uh, thinking, uh, you know, oh, I can just stop in and, you know, we, we have to say no. So we see an opportunity there uh, to, to serve more people and support the program. Uh, removing or reducing the application fee? Uh, it, our application fee? Well, it, it's no. the application fee to the, to the registry, right, Meg? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the, so the patient fee for a card? Yeah. 
Yeah, we were supportive of yes. I mean, you know, and I think even with, hey, if a person has uh, MS, they have Parkinson's, you know, like, why are they renew having to renew each year potentially? You know, this, this is the condition that is not going away. They're going to, to have this the rest of their lives. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we, we would be supportive of that. Okay. Those were the softballs. Here's, here's the one that has become just a little bit of a lightning rod, but uh, the definition of caregiver in the, in the statute, you want to expand that as far as medical or physical caregivers um, so that it's not restricted to one one to one. Uh, but because there's ambiguity about whether or not the caregiver is also typically a grower, um, and then expanding the grower to allow well, well, we, we keep the, redefine the caregiver as a, as a medical caregiver. But, but the question is, has come up, well, um, can a patient have more than one or provide product to them? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, you know, yeah, I have a couple, you know, I mean, I could see potentially two caregivers, a caregiver that's going to help the person make purchases at the dispensary, you know, they're really a person that's assisting somebody that is uh, potentially got a, you know, traumatic or terminal illness, they have a caregiver, they help them. My neighbor is going through that right now. Uh, I, I know the caregiver, I see her arrive every day, I say hello to her. Uh, and, you know, she's there to assist uh, this person in their day to day lives, you know. And then I can see, hey, another caregiver to help grow cannabis for the patient. Uh, that makes sense. So I can see two caregivers, one being someone that's assisting the person, you know, with their day-to-day -day living, and then another caregiver that is assigned to grow cannabis for that, uh, for that person. Um, you know, if we're getting into multiple growers uh, for a patient, I would think potentially the craft craft license is where that person wants to go uh, you know apply for a craft license you get the license and you want you want to be a caregiver for somebody well th there it is I don't think that craft license is going to be um, expensive I think it's going to be reasonably priced they can come into the market that way and then they also could potentially uh, expand their operations if they find it something they want to you know uh, pursue full-time and they're already in the system that way they've already applied they've got that they can proceed forward. Thank you. Guys, any other follow-up questions? Yeah, Sheen, could you touch a little bit on the um, delivery services that you offer? Uh, for sure, you know, and, it, uh, and it's all a dispensary, so I wouldn't say it's just us, but we do, you know, we do delivery throughout the state of Vermont. And, you know, it's something we pride ourselves on uh, that we will go to, to every corner of the state, uh, you know, and, and sometimes that's not economically feasible to make a trip uh, maybe up to, the, you know, uh, Northeast Kingdom or, or up to the border uh, here um, and same down in Brattleboro. Uh, I know we make trips into Bennington. Um, and so uh, we're committed to that, though, and that, that, that's what we signed up for, you know, and, and so uh, it's our job then to manage those routes and, and make them efficient. Um, and it's a service, though, that, that we provide happily and, and want to actually uh, develop it more, you know, and some of that for us is back to product, you know, so, you know, ideally we would have uh, an ability maybe to have a location that uh, is, a, is a warehouse, you know, and great, that's uh, the warehouse, that's where we uh, can do deliveries out of to be more economical and serving for monitors, but it could potentially go a whole other subject, so, um, but we do provide delivery service, it's free over I think $150, uh, you make a $150 purchase, it's a free delivery, and if it's under $150, I believe it's $5 for the delivery. Um, which I, you know, I think that is uh, reasonable, and I, I know that doesn't cover our costs. So, uh, Shane, I met saw kind of an uptick in. Did you see an uptick in delivery since the pandemic? Uh, yes, and then, but curbside really was the uh, the formula that worked best in the end. Uh, that ability to come in, place the order online. Um, you know, and it, we're fortunate in Brattleboro, we have a drive-through. 
and so it's a former bank, you know, so we have a bank drive through and just that ability to, to uh, process, you know, the transactions quickly and move through um, and keeps the, our patients safe and our customer, our, our staff safe, um, it worked well. And then up here in Burlington, um, the curbside worked real. I don't know what I don't know what to say other than the true convenience of just being able to pull up in your car, not have to get out of your car. That that was a, a, a win for for us and the patients. Yeah, I, I, I know we're running out of time, and it was helpful. Um, sorry, Jim, did you have? Another you know, it's it's it really doesn't pertain to this committee. I'm going to pass. Okay, uh, feel free. Otherwise, um, I mean, it's helpful to know. I I, I didn't realize. Um, it was by appointment only. Are there any other, um, any other kind of nuances or things like that that you've asked the state that we should know about just from adjusting the medical program? Yeah, you know, and uh, I do, it might have been mentioned already in there, but IDs, you know, uh, potentially. Um, right now, if we want to hire someone, their ID gets designated to Series Med, so they get designated to us, you know, versus the program. You know, and it gives that, uh, you know, provides flexibility, uh, potentially uh, allows someone to get an ID, uh, get into the program, you know, be able to work within the program. Maybe not even, don't have to designate a dispenser. You go through the process, have a card. So what we run into and what I'm getting to in a long belt way is like we have fall harvest right now. That's a real stress and demand on my staff to bring down a certain number of plants, dry them, cure them. We would love to bring in temp workers. We can't do it because it doesn't make any sense to, to hire someone for just four weeks uh, because it takes sometimes six weeks to get an ID, you know. And so, how do we streamline that process so that uh, this is even for future businesses that are coming in, so that um, everybody can staff up and have flexibility in that staffing um, because it, it's it's the, one of the most important things your staff. So, uh, I imagine you've had some conversations with Carrie about this uh, uh, you know, that they do in other agricultural industries yeah uh, yeah so conversation with carries you know we drive we've had conversations with temp agencies as well you know and then we're starting to get into the federal part though and their comfort level coming into a federally legal thing and you know and that and that's really that's this pressure point then too it's like we can't go outside the system you know and so how does the system create something for the industry here in Vermont that works, knowing that there are these pressures put on it. And those are the stresses that future uh, entrepreneurs are going to feel, and they're real. And, you know, you're working in a regulated industry, you got to go by the rules, and, and there's no way around it. Um, and I'm sure you know out in Arizona, um, it, it, it's... Um, Trying to build in some flexibility into a regulated uh, industry is difficult. So, sure. Shane, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I, I think I think the chairman beat his hand up. No, first. please, Meg, go ahead. Uh, Shane, I was just going to ask if you could speak a little bit to the regulations of the medical, and then whether or not you know they're aligning with adult use and just in terms of those pressures on your staff? Um. Yeah, for sure, Diana, thanks for your question, Meg. Um, you know, how do we make sure the medical rules and regs are no more uh, constrictive than the future recreational market rules for staff? And how do we create as much continuity between the two programs to eliminate confusion about those regulations so everybody's playing by the same rule book here it is we're all abiding by the same rules it's not oh it's different over here and you do this over here it's that's too confusing it's too stressful uh you know and, and how do we remove some of the onerous things that are placed on staff right now because i have staff that you know make mistakes and you know they're just human mistakes and they're afraid they're going to lose their job uh, and that's really stressful. And then we potentially, we do lose people that say, I, I just can't deal with the stress. You know, I, I want to be in the cannabis industry, but some of these rules are just illogical and they don't make sense. And I can't, you know, uh, participate in that. And so how, how do we make the two programs uh, congruent with one another? And one of those places for sure is an inventory. Like, let's not count 
medical plants and recreational plants. Let's have one system for counting the plants. And then when we harvest and cure and produce oil, let's designate that's for medical, that's for recreational. And so when the kind of it's a whip, it's a work in progress, that's the place to start saying that should go here, that should go there. Uh, because if you do it down at the, at the uh, plant level, uh, it, it just adds a bunch of burdensome um, regulations that uh, really don't achieve anything. Jim, go ahead. Uh, Shane, thanks for being here. Um, so, you know, my primary concern uh, is that the patients are not adversely impacted by the onset of adult use. And, um, you know, my, I appreciate the commitment to maintaining the kind of conduit of services and minimum products to ensure that the Vermont patients have access to their medicine um, during this transition and beyond. Um, but when you think about things like reciprocity and changing the designated dispensary rule, that adds a degree of uncertainty to your clientele, your customers. Um, and I'm wondering how you can kind of square those two where you're gonna maintain minimum products or minimum supplies of products, but then allow an unknown number of new customers into the dispensaries. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we'd start off back to percentages and saying, all right, this is the percentage we're going to expect an increase in demand. And so if we're expecting that, uh, how do we prepare for that and get that level of product and inventory ready uh, for that? Uh, there'll be adjustments along the way. You know, some of this for us uh, on the scaling part of this is coming into this future market. Uh, we want to have a new facility. We, we want to be able to um, Utilize you know, a new HVAC system, new processes that we haven't been able to do in our old facility so that we can have uh, larger yields. And so how do we become more efficient? How do we produce more uh, with less uh, so that we can project that, hey, we're going to see a 10% uh, bump here and we need to be ready for that. And if that needs to be done and designated and saying, hey, Vermont patients potentially you know, are served first. I don't know if that's allowed. I don't know if that's legal. Uh, but I, I'm all for, um, you know, serving Vermonters first here, uh, but I also think the reciprocity is, is really important. We have 13 million visitors to the state of Vermont uh, that uh, potentially are carrying medical cards, uh, and we'd like the ability to, to service them because that it helps sustain the program. The program right now is, is decreasing uh, and has been for, for three years. Uh, we saw a little bump during COVID, uh, but uh, the program has been shrinking. Uh, and uh, the Vicente Cedarburg model shows the program decreasing by 3% over the next three to four years. And so um, I would hope the reciprocity would actually uh, continue to uh, support the program and allow us to build on it. I know we're over time. Um, thanks again, Shane. Uh, very informative and, and helpful. Uh, and I need, I think the committee probably needs a little time to digest some of this, including the, the inventory comment you just had at the end. Um, but thank you again for your time. Very helpful. Well, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for, for inviting me here. And, uh, you know, if there's any follow up, uh, I'm happy to, to do that. And uh, I do have some documents I'll probably forward in just uh, some bullet points so you guys can, you know, uh, read it and see it in print. And again, thank you for the time. and. Um, you know, thinking about our program. So, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. And since we're at time, can I just get a motion to adjourn? Motion. The week. Second. Okay. We are adjourning. Second.